Okay, folks, we are back and we're about to begin chapter 19 in our textbook, and that deals with oxidation and reduction reactions. Now we're just going to jump right into it, and we're going to define a couple of terms. First of all, oxidation is a reaction. I'm just going to put Rxn for reaction. That involves the loss of electrons. You know, my symbol for an electron is E with a negative sign. So if I have a reaction that involves something losing electrons, we say that that's an oxidation reaction. Now, reduction is pretty similar. It's the opposite. I guess that's not similar. It's the opposite of similar. <laughs> it is a reaction that involves the gain of electrons. So, of course, if something loses electrons, they just can't disappear in the universe. They have to go somewhere, and they have to go towards the thing that's reduced or that gains electrons. Now, some kids get a little bit confused with the term reduction. If you read the definition, maybe you can see why. Reduction is a reaction that involves the gain of electrons. Why would we call it reduction if we're gaining something? Now, think about that for a minute. We're, we're going to get to it later on in our notes, but see if you can maybe problem solve and figure out where the term reduction came from without my help. Remember, it's gaining electrons. Think about that. Now, an oxidizing agent is the species that contains the element reduced. So an agent helps something do something. So if it's an oxidizing agent, it's helping something get oxidized. Now, how could I help something get oxidized? How could I help something lose electrons? Well, I could gain them. Yeah, so I would be the element reduced because I'm gaining electrons, and that would make me the oxidizing agent because I'm helping something else get oxidized. Think about that. The reducing agent is the species that contains the element oxidized. So let's see. Um, if I want to help something get reduced, I'm an agent. I'm helping something get reduced. I'm helping something gain electrons. How could I help something gain electrons? Well. I could lose electrons, or I could become oxidized. So the reducing agent is the species that contains the element that is oxidized. Now, way back when I was in high school, my science teacher taught me this cute little sentence to help me keep oxidation and reduction straight. Leo the lion goes ger. Of course, Leo and ger are acronyms. Leo is standing for stands for lose electrons as oxidation, and ger gain electrons reduction. If you remember that cute little sentence, you will never forget what oxidation is, and you will never confuse it with reduction. Lose electrons oxidation, gain electrons is reduction. Now, to determine if something has been oxidized or reduced in a chemical reaction, it's nice to be able to assign what we call oxidation numbers. Now, oxidation numbers are the apparent charge that an atom has in a molecule or an ion. We've done this earlier this year, actually, when dealing with ionic compounds. For instance, Na2S is an ionic compound. The oxidation number for sodium, we learned, is positive 1. You might remember this periodic table. It's the same one we used months ago. Sodium's in group 1. It loses one electron, so it has an oxidation number or charge of positive 1. Sulfur, let's see, what is that? Well, sulfur is in group 16. It gains two electrons to become like argon, so its oxidation number is negative 2. That should be pretty easy, and you should recall doing that. But we need a method for determining the apparent charge of atoms in covalent molecules or other situations where it's not quite so obvious. Your book does a pretty good job with this, and it's on page 631 of your text. However, I think I do a better job, and I'm going to chop those rules, they have like six or seven, down to three, just to simplify it a bit. And if you follow these three rules, you can find the oxidation number for any atom in any ion or any compound. Here we go. Rule number one is the easiest. All elements 
have an oxidation number. And I'm going to go ox number, just like that, of zero. Now they're not sharing or transferring electrons to anything else. They are by themselves. So they have what's called an oxidation number or charge of zero. So if I had silver, elemental silver involved in a chemical reaction, its oxidation number would be zero. If I had elemental oxygen, which you folks know is diatomic, O2, its oxidation number would be zero. All elements have an oxidation number of zero. Number two. Uh, the most electronegative element, and electronegative is sort of a long word, electronegative element in a compound or ion will take its charge. Now, what the heck does that mean? Well, first of all, let's review what electronegativity is. Electronegativity is the relative attraction that an atom has for a shared pair of electrons. And as you recall, it increases when you move up a group or to the right of a period. In fact, the most electronegative element is fluorine. It's to the highest and to the rightest of the periodic table. We don't include noble gases when we determine electronegativity values because, generally speaking, they don't form bonds. They don't share electrons, so we don't include them. So the most electronegative element is fluorine, followed by oxygen and then nitrogen. Those are the three most electronegatives. So fluorine's charge would be negative one. Oxygens would be negative 2, nitrogens would be negative 3. So we find the most electronegative element in our ion or compound, and it will take its charge. And that charge will be negative. Okay, so it will be negative something. Okay, that's rule number 2. So find the most electronegative element in the ion or compound and give it its charge. And the last rule, the sum of all oxidation numbers in a compound is zero in an ion, the sum will be the charge of the ion. So add positives appropriately. Okay, so the sum of all oxidation numbers in a molecule or an ion must add up to either zero if it's, an all, if it's a molecule or the charge of the ion if it's an ion. Now the best way to go through these three rules is to do just a bunch of examples. And after I do five or six, you will really get the hang of this quite quickly and you might even be able to work ahead of me. So let's just work some examples. I have some on the next page. Uh, I think we do about 15 or 16 of these things. And we actually get, like I said, pretty good at these. In fact, you should be able to determine oxidation numbers just by glancing at the molecule or ion, and you can make those assignments quite quickly. Now, just a quick note. Remember that the oxidation numbers are what we call the apparent charge that an atom has. It may or may not represent the real charge. So, let's take a look at example number one, H2O, water. Remember, uh, we find the most electronegative atom in an element or compound, and we give it its charge. So, um, in water, the most electronegative atom is oxygen, and its charge is 2 negative. It's in group 16. Then, the sum of all the charges must add up to zero, because this is a neutral compound. So, I have to get two positives. I have two hydrogens, so that would mean each hydrogen would have an oxidation number of positive one. Now I always like to check, even though this is a simple one, make sure that they have at least an electron to lose. And of course, hydrogen's in group one, it has one electron, so it can lose up to one. 
lithium can lose up to one. Sodium can lose up to one. What about beryllium, magnesium, and calcium in group two? Well, if they were in a compound, they could lose up to two electrons. Boron, aluminum, gallium, they're in group 13. They could lose up to three. Carbon's family could lose up to four, and so on. So I feel pretty confident that hydrogen has a positive one oxidation number. Let's skip letter B just for a second and go on to letter C. CO. What's the most electronegative element in this compound? Well, it's oxygen again, so we're going to give it its charge, two negative. Well, does that make carbon's oxidation number? Well, the sum needs to add up to zero, so carbon must be two positive. Is it possible for carbon to have uh, oxidation number of two plus? Well, it's in group 14. It could be all the way up to four plus, so two plus sounds reasonable. Letter D, CO2. Oxygen is the most electronegative, it's two negative. There are two of them. That gives me four negatives. I have to have four positives. There's only one carbon, so that must be carbon's oxidation number in CO2. And as we just saw a moment ago, carbon is in group 14. It can lose up to four electrons, so it's possible for its oxidation number to be four plus. Now let's go back up to letter B. I would bet if I let you do this without pausing, you would say, okay, oxygen is negative two, right? It's the most electronegative. Hummer said it takes its charge. Okay, well, let's make it negative two. There are two of them, so that gives me four negatives, right? So I need four positives. I have two hydrogens to split that charge. So you might think that hydrogen would be plus two. Hmm, is it possible? Well, heavens no, hydrogen only has one electron. The mostest it could be is positive one. So we know that that will not work. So sometimes we have to oh, reason things out with our rules. The most electronegative element can only be as negative as it's allowed to be. So let's try negative one for oxygen. Would that work? Well, there are two of them, so that would be two negatives, and that means each hydrogen would be positive one, and that does work. Now, that situation's unusual. You rarely will stumble across it, but every once in a while you will. So remember, the most electronegative element can only be as negative as it's allowed to be. What allows it to be? Well, dep depends upon how positive the other part of the molecular ion can become. Okay, let's do letter E. The most electronegative here is oxygen, so we're going to assign it an oxidation number of two negative. So now we can either do hydrogen or nitrogen next. Why will I do hydrogen next? That's right, it can only be positive one. That's as high of an oxidation number as it can have. So I now have six negatives. I have one positive. That means that nitrogen will take over the other five positives. So nitrogen in this compound, HNO3, will have an oxidation number of five positive. And there's nitrogen, it's in group one, two, three, four, five, it's in group 15, so it can lose up to five. If you had a compound that said nitrogen was six positive, I would go back and check your work because it cannot lose that many. Okay, letter F, Na2SO3. Oxygen's two negative. Now will I do sodium or sulfur next? Yeah, sodium's in group one. It can only be positive one. It can't be any more positive than that. So we'll do sodium next. That gives me two positives against six negatives. So the other four positives come from my sulfur. And sulfur's in group 16. It can be up to four positive. Letter G, KMNO4. Oxygen's two negative. Potassium's positive one. It's in group one. That's all it can be. And what does that make manganese? So you have eight negatives and one positive. Hmm, seven plus. That's a very high oxidation number. I wonder if that's possible. So, manganese ends with 4s2, 3d, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, yeah, 4s2, 3d5, it could lose up to 7. So 7 plus is reasonable. It's a very high oxidation number. It's dying to be reduced. All right, letter H. By the way, I hope you're pausing the video and trying these on your own before I solve them. I'm assuming that's what's happening. If not, just relax and listen to the show, and hopefully you can pick this up just watching me doing it. Oxygen's two negative, calcium's two positive. It's in group two, it can't be any higher than that. Now I have six oxygens that are two negative apiece. That's 12 negatives. 
I have two positives so far from my calcium. Doesn't that mean that the nitrogen um, has to make up for 10 positives? And there are two of them, so that means each nitrogen is 5 plus. Okay, letter I. Oxygen's two negative, sodium's one plus, that's six negatives. Against two positives, that means carbon can be up to four plus, and sure enough it is. Letter J, NO2. Oxygen's two negative, so that would make my nitrogen four positive. Check to make sure that's possible, and it is. Now letter K is interesting. This is an ion. So remember what we said, the sum of the charge in a compound is zero, the sum of the charge in an ion is the charge of that ion. So oxygen's two negative, hydrogen's one positive, that gives me eight negatives and one positive. Now sulfur is not seven positive, it can't be. The highest it can be is six positive. Does that work? Let's see, seven positives against eight negatives, I would have one negative left over? Yes, that does work. The oxidation number of sulfur and the HSO4 negative ion is 6 positive. Okay, letter L. Oxygen's 2 negative, hydrogen's 1 plus. We have 14 negatives, 2 positives. I need 12 more positives. There are 2 sulfurs to get me there, so each one is 6. Letter M. Well, the most electronegative is sulfur. Sulfur will then take its charge. Sulfur is in group 16, so it would be 2 negative. That gives me six negatives. I need six positives with two aluminums. That means each aluminum is three plus. I know this video is going a bit long, but that's okay. I think you guys are enjoying this. You want it to go on forever, don't you? MnCl2. Chlorine is the most electronegative. It's negative one. It's in group 17. That gives me two negatives, so manganese will be two positive. Letter O. This one might be a bit tricky to sum. Oxygen's the most electronegative, it's two negative, that's 12 negatives. Hydrogen would be one plus, that's as high as it can be. That gives me 12 positives. What well, does that leave carbon? It leaves carbon with an oxidation number of zero. So sometimes in a compound, an element in that compound might have an oxidation number of zero. And letter P, MN3O4. Oxygen's two negative, that's eight negatives. But I have to split that charge with three manganeses. So I claim that would be a positive eight-thirds. Now that's an average charge. Some of those manganese atoms will be three positive, and some of them will be two positive for an average of eight-thirds. Does that make sense? Yeah, there are three manganeses. We need to get up to positive eight. How about if two of them were three plus, and the other one was two plus? That would work. So this would be the average oxidation number of the manganese atoms in that compound. Okay? Now that's your quick lesson on how to determine oxidation numbers and a little bit of vocabulary. In the next video, we're going to apply it to some chemical reactions. We're going to look at a reaction, assign oxidation numbers to each atom, and then we'll determine what was oxidized, reduced, and what my oxidizing and reducing agents are. So stay tuned. Bye-bye.